The subject of this webinar is designing and troubleshooting Wave Custom Ortho K lenses using the Oculus Pentacam. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Jarris. I'm in private practice in Marietta, Georgia. I've specialized in Ortho K for 37 years and I've been using Wave for the past 16. I've been a Wave clinical support consultant since August 2020. Our understanding of Ortho-K has increased enormously over the years. Along with this increase in knowledge have come more complex lens designs and tools to improve our results with both simple and more complex Ortho-K cases. WAVE has been a leader in developing these tools. Before we get into the specifics of WAVE design, I want to go over the basics of Ortho-K to make sure we all have a good foundation that will help us later on. Ortho-K requires a common language with standardized terminology. We need to be fluent and precise in this language. For example, an optic zone has a shape that is described as round or oval, but not ever as spherical or toric, which is how curvature of a base curve is described. Everyone should know the difference between an oval refraction which is done over the contact lens on the patient's eye and a post-treatment spectacle refraction, which is done on a follow-up visit with the contact lens off. Become familiar with the commonly used abbreviations for terms that take longer to say and write. Know that AC stands for apical clearance. TLT is tear layer thickness. OZ is optic zone, BC is base curve, TZ is treatment zone, AZ is alignment zone, RZ is return zone, etc. Becoming a wave wizard starts with knowing the anatomy of an ortho K lens, how the different lens zones contribute to the environment that creates the ortho K effect, and how making changes to these zones affects the results. Ortho-K works as a result primarily of hydraulic tear layer forces created by having a closed system underneath the contact lens where tears are sucked from the lowest or thinnest layer to the highest or thickest layer, displacing the corneal epithelium in the same direction. The return zone is the primary driver of the outward suctional force creating a gradient or differential between the thin central tear layer and the thick return zone tear layer. The higher or thicker the return zone tear layer, the greater the gradient between the central and peripheral tear layer heights, and the greater the outward tear layer force created. The optic zone diameter and the base curve combine with the return zone to help create the amount of topo demand and epithelial displacement that can occur. The smaller the optic zone, the flatter the base curve, and the higher the return zone, the greater the topo demand that can be created, and the greater the amount of refractive error that can be corrected. The alignment zone creates the required closed system underneath the lens by sealing off the tear flow from outside the lens. It is also the primary factor in promoting lens centration. If it is too narrow, there will be less ability to grip the corneal periphery, which can lead to decentration. Making it wider will increase the area that can grip the peripheral cornea and improve centration. If it is too loose, allowing tears to escape, the closed system becomes compromised causing insufficient outward suctional force and resulting in refractive error under correction. If it is too tight, the gradient or differential between the thin central tear layer and the thick return zone tear layer is compromised, resulting in insufficient outward suctional force, refractive error under correction, and an unexpectedly small treatment zone or central island. Much ado is made by most Ortho-K lens manufacturers of the importance of obtaining the proper fluorescein pattern 
in order to achieve a successful result. There are three problems with relying on fluorescein patterns to predict a successful refractive result. One of them is that the human eye cannot detect the presence of fluorescein with less than 20 microns of tear layer thickness, so it is extremely difficult to distinguish even minuscule differences in fitting patterns. Here we see fluorescein patterns of five lenses with different base curves on the same eye. Which of them is considered the ideal fit that will produce the best result? Can you tell? The ideal fit, according to this manufacturer, is the one in the top row middle image with seven microns of apical clearance. Did you get it right? Well, don't pat yourself on the back too fast, because another problem is that the fluorescein pattern changes quickly after lens insertion. These three photos are of the same lens on the same eye, taken just after insertion, then after 30 seconds, and then after one minute. The question we have to ask is, when is the most accurate time to evaluate the fluorescein pattern as we try to get that perfect looking fit that is supposed to give us the best ortho K result. Not that this matters anyway, because the biggest problem with relying on fluorescein pattern analysis to predict success is that we are judging a fit with the eyes open, but ortho K lenses are worn during sleep with the eyes closed. So although a textbook perfect fluorescein pattern with eyes wide open may be initially encouraging, or discouraging, it is the influence of the upper eyelids when the eyes are closed that will exert the most influence on the final outcome. Don't throw away your fluorescein strips, though. This is still a very valuable tool in troubleshooting, just not the most valuable that we have. Those same lens manufacturers also tell you that when you get that textbook perfect fit, their lenses have a very high first lens success rate. One set of lenses and you're all done? Cha-ching! Unfortunately, this one and done claim is more than a bit misleading, since the majority of cases that their lenses are tested on are not complicated. But cases that may appear simple to a less experienced doctor often have a way of suddenly becoming very complicated because of some factor that the doctor wasn't able to see. Then that expression, one and done, becomes ten and still not done. These are the cases that can only be solved with a customizable lens. Wave has a whole arsenal of custom design tools for solving fitting problems that non-customizable lenses just can't. Wave doctors routinely have success with more cases than doctors who use non-customizable lenses. If your goal is to have the highest first lens success rate, then Wave will certainly help somewhat compared to other brands. But if your goal is to build a successful ortho -K practice by increasing the number of your successfully fit patients, then Wave is the best tool you could possibly have. It is important that we define the term successful result for ortho -K as well as for myopia control. I will never forget an ortho K patient I had a long time ago who was about a minus six something. I got her to Plano Sphere 2015 OU, no halos in one week with perfectly centered, huge treatment zones. It could not have been a more perfect result, right? But no, the patient was unhappy because her vision with the lenses off wasn't as sharp as with them on. And that's the vision she wanted. She made a big fuss. I was paralyzed in shock. I didn't want to risk bad publicity, so I ended up refunding most of her money. Moral of the story, letting patients define a successful ortho -K result is not smart. But should the doctor be the one to define it? One popular and cutesy doctor definition of a successful ortho K result is 20 happy.
In other words, when the patient is happy, even if the doctor knows he could improve their VA even more, it's easy to think, this patient is saying that this is good enough. I can stop spending more of my time and money here. Another doctor definition of a successful ortho care result is when patients want their VA to be a little bit better, but the doctor doesn't know how to improve it any further. So they say to the patient, sorry, but this is the best that can be done. And then the patient trusts the doctor and just accepts good enough. So what is a successful myopia control result? I believe that most studies of the effectiveness of ortho K on myopia progression have shown an approximately 50% decrease in progression. What this means in a simplified way is that if your patient had been getting one diopter more nearsighted each year before starting ortho K, they have been getting less than a half a diopter more nearsighted each year since treatment. I've seen much better results in my patients somewhere between 80 and 90% decrease in progression. Whenever we see a kid who is progressing more than my expected results, I begin my interrogation by determining if the worst result is due to lower actual wearing time than reported. This is handled easily enough, but if the lenses are in fact being worn every night, then I can improve the future results by doing one or more of the following. Increasing the topo demand, decreasing the optic zone diameter, increasing peripheral plus inside the pupil. I have yet to put a kid who's doing wave ortho K on atropine. Why is it important to define success rate? Because it is important to understand who uses the term and why. Lens manufacturers promote their success rates to sell us their lenses. Doctors promote our success rates to sell potential patients our services, and potential patients ask what our success rates are to assess the risk of losing their money. Defining a success rate depends primarily on the level of difficulty of the cases involved. Easy cases should theoretically have a higher success rate than difficult complex cases. Make no mistake. There are plenty of people looking for an ortho-K doctor who will want to know your success rate so they can compare you with other ortho-K doctors. If you routinely take on more difficult and complex cases, as I do, your best response is to state your success rate for cases that are similar to the specific details of your patient's particular case. There's just enough potential whining on the patient's part and just enough potential greed on the doctor's part to make the case for trying to create an objective definition for a successful result. Our practice uses this objective definition that I came up with subjectively. All day visual acuity without lenses, measured with a standard eye chart, stays within two lines of the patient's best corrected visual acuity with minimal or no corneal eyelid or conjunctival health issues. This definition is certainly objective in that it relies only on objectively measured test results and not on how either the patient or doctor feels about the results. But I subjectively set the visual acuity level where I felt comfortable that I could deliver in 100% of cases. I typically assure patients that I am, quote, 99% certain that they're going to get 20-20 vision, but I can't guarantee it 100%. This is just a brief list of some of the many wave tools available and what they can be used for. I won't go through this list here. This is just to whet your appetite for when you get serious about upping your game. So what's so great about using the Pentacam for Ortho-K lens design? Well, there's much less work and skill involved in obtaining a design quality scan. The corneal scans take one second and are automatically captured when the instrument senses that the patient is lined up. Scans measure the actual cornea, not the tear film, so tear film abnormalities do not affect the scan accuracy. 
There's no hassle with deep set eyeballs because the instrument remains far away from the patient's eyes. We get more data because the area scanned is larger. We get more raw data and less extrapolated data. There is no dots editing or erasing or doctor performed extrapolation, so subjective doctor error is eliminated. The HVID is measured automatically by the instrument. Data collected includes pan corneal pachymetry, so there's no need for anterior seg OCT pachymetry or a handheld device. Displays include front and back curvature, axial and elevation, pachymetry, formap, and difference maps. The Pentacam's general overview display lets you see each of the 25 or 50 axis slices of the corneal or scleral tomograph scan, the flattest and steepest axes, the E value, pupil diameter, and HVID measured from white to white and designated as HWTW. Here I've got Pentacam's format display up and it's showing the front axial, uh, front elevation, back elevation, and the corneal thickness. And you can change the displays to show whatever information you'd like on here. I don't like to have mine cluttered up, um, so this is about what I like to see. Um, this lets me see that I've got a somewhat asymmetrically decentered down cornea. There's the, um, the um, steepest corneal curvature right there, so I might be a little bit concerned that a lens on this I might decenter down. Elevation map is nice to see if I need an R-SIM versus a G-SIM versus a free form. I can click anywhere here. Oh, this white line here is nine millimeters. So you can see that we're getting a lot more data than uh, we get with uh, other topographers. Uh, if I click here and move this up to where I'm at about three and a half millimeters away from the center of the pupil, I can get uh, the approximate elevation there. And then the same thing at the bottom. I'm going to go out to where the Y value says about three and a half. And it's about seven microns there. Same thing on the sides. I can see what the elevation is, where my uh, alignment zone is going to be at about seven millimeters. And trying to get that over to three and a half, um, it's about six, and then the same thing over on this side, uh, get to be about three and a half. So I can tell that there's maybe only about, uh, there was pretty good symmetry vertically and pretty good symmetry horizontally, and maybe a total of um, about 13 microns difference between the vertical and the horizontal. So, uh, Maybe you could use an R-SIM lens here if you wanted to. Um, this is nice when I see a an asymmetric cornea where the steepest curvature is uh, inferior. I might be thinking, oh, I wonder if perhaps I'm getting incipient keratoconus. Well, if I look at the um, uh, corneal thickness map, um, I can see that I don't really have to worry about that just yet. I can... Uh, show more than five values if I'd like, and that uh, tells me a little bit more. Um, elevation on the back, if you're concerned that uh, somebody might be developing keratoconus on the back of their cornea first, this is very helpful. Over here, this tells me my uh, flat and steep curvatures, uh, marks it in red for the steep Marks it in blue for the flat. Tells me my average corneal curvature, how much astigmatism there is, my eccentricity value. It's just a really great display. So let's design a wave ortho K lens. Uh, I've got the tangential map displayed here, and we see that the horizontal white to white HVID is 12.2 millimeters, already. Uh, automatically measured, measures the pupil diameter and the eccentricity. 
is 0.55 and um, the astigmatism is 0.7 diopters. Um, this does not look like a complicated case. Uh, it does look like the cornea is, has some asymmetry, so the lens might be centered down a little bit. Um, this patient is 12 years old. Let's go ahead and open up the WAVE software. And uh, the RX is a minus 5 sphere. We're not going to average the astigmatism because <clears throat> we want the most accurate uh, data possible. And because of the asymmetry, that makes it doubly important that we don't average the astigmatism. I'm going to go ahead and enter in the prescription now. And I'll expand the window. So Wave automatically defaults to um, um, a lens, uh, just a regular RGP lens that'll fit. But I go to Tools, and I'm going to hit my Configuration Settings. It automatically defaults to VST Ortho K lens. So you know that if you use this, um, this is a good starting point. Uh, but I have created a whole bunch of um, settings of my own that I automatically go to. And I've got them uh, for ortho -K, I've got them set up by uh, optic zone size. So since this is going to be a myopia control case, I am not going to go with the standard 6.2 and 6.8. I want it a little bit smaller. Uh, I set my... Uh, all these are set up automatically in advance. My apical clearance is zero because I want an alignment fit. My bevel lift I usually set to about 14 or 15. Uh, edge thickness and center thickness. Uh, typical ortho K cases involve uh, a little bit of corneal astigmatism and maybe a little bit of refractive astigmatism or, or not. So you want to sphericalize the cornea in most cases. And you're going to need a center thickness uh, that's thick enough so that the lens won't warp on the eye. Um, the target lens power, <clears throat> this is um, typically what we would use for uh, somebody with low myopia with uh, a minus 5. I'm going to change that to a 150, give it a little bit more what we call topo demand. And because the... Um, HVID was 12.2. I'm going to set this to 11.5. I don't think I need to go all the way up to a 12.0. A lot of people like to go uh, 0.3 millimeters less than the HVID, but the vertical iris diameter is uh, smaller than the horizontal by about a millimeter. So I think 11.5 should be about right uh, for the average uh, corneal diameter. I always check my edge box because I like to see a smooth uh, ed edge displayed all the way around the lens. And I usually design an axial, but with the Panacam, I found that the periphery is about 15 microns flatter than what the Scout used to measure when I had one. And so if I go with tangential, I'm going to get the periphery to fit a little bit better. I always fit freeform. I don't like to use the minimum blending in ortho K. No need to use the node or um, the asphericity or prism. So then we hit continue. And Wave will design the lens. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so it's done. Um, and I'm just looking at uh, some of the different things here. I want to make sure that uh, I, I do have my alignment fit here. It does look like the uh, tail end of the alignment zones are sloping up a little bit. We'll check all the meridians and see if that's the case. So it does look that way. I'm going to just bring it down a little bit. Notice that I've got the area that I'm affecting set to all. Because uh, I am, I do want to do the same uh, the same alteration in all the meridians. So what's happened now is I've uh, made it a little bit too steep, perhaps in the very periphery, and I've raised the apical clearance to 1.6. So I'm going to bring that back down to or back up to where it was, and I should have it back down to zero pretty close in the um, um, apical clearance. It's not exactly, so I'm just going to go ahead and click up on the blue ball to get this to be more close to zero there, and it is. So now it looks like I probably have as close to uh, an alignment fit as I can. And I'm just going to check around and see what the uh, bevel lifts are. They're a little bit low, so I'm going to raise those up a tiny bit. Get it somewhere around 14 or 15. So now, oh, it's 14-ish. Uh, Checking each meridian, 13 and a half. I think I'll click up one more time. Again, in all, doesn't have to be exact with the, with the bevel lift. And, and now I want to check and make sure that all of my slopes are nice and smooth, that there are no kinks. One way that you can tell if there's a kink is by looking in this uh, map and uh, seeing if the um, uh, there are any uh, discrepancies in the um, the return zone shape there. So going around, it looks like uh, all the curvatures look good, and I'm pretty happy with this. Um, my topo demand is about six and a half, and that's about right for what I want to have going on here. And I, I check over here to make sure that I didn't accidentally click up or down on my red ball, which would give different base curves and powers in different meridians. And here I do have a spherical base curve and a pretty spherical lens power. I'm pretty happy with this. Um, it looks like checking the uh, back curvature looks pretty even there. I'm not so worried about the front curvature. Uh, everything looks good.